Just responding to that, uh, to to Daniel about the free the free will stuff, and he's calling people slippery and snaky and stuff. He didn't really deal with any scripture, and I'd I'd like to have that conversation with Daniel about free will and God's sovereignty. Okay, I mean, then yeah, I, I'm yeah. actually very interested because you're a, you're a legend on the server, and we haven't heard much from you, so we can do that. We can uh, we can make this a moment I'm, I'm where. Okay, we'll, we'll make this a moment where Truth Speller is going up against Daniel and they're trying to. Yeah, I was going to respond to what Daniel was saying, because in the scripture, if we operate from God's mind and his perspective about the nature of reality, it says there's none righteous, no, not even one. There's none who understand and there's none who seek after God. That's a universal claim about all humanity. That in their unrighteousness, they do not seek after God. They don't understand. So how is that rectified? How do people come to understand? How do people come to seek God? Well, Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ, in Isaiah 43.10 says, You are my witnesses, declare the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and understand and believe that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me, I alone am the Savior. That he has chosen people, to know and understand when left to ourselves there's none who understands so it says he's chosen people that they would know and understand and believe your position in free will is that anyone can just choose to understand and know and believe jesus is saying the very opposite i see that echoing off into the new testament where there's this personal individual effectual calling on people that god has chosen like consider your own calling brother and not many wise not many noble not many mighty according to the flesh have been called, but God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the mighty. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise and the debased and the despised things God has chosen and the things that are not to nullify the things that are that no man may boast before God, but by his own doing you're in Christ Jesus. So there's this personal individual effectual calling where it says not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty according to the flesh have been called. Consider your own calling. It says, that God has done the choosing that we would be in Christ Jesus, that by his own doing you're in Christ Jesus, so that no one would boast before the Lord. When it comes to being in Christ Jesus, there's a personal, individual, factual calling. And that's what Jesus was referencing when he says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, they follow me, I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father has given them to me as greater than all and no one will snatch them out of his hand. I and my father are one. So there's a personal, individual, effectual calling where Jesus says he, his sheep will hear his voice. The ones he's chosen to be saved, the one he's chosen to know and understand and believe that he is he. Uh, you know, so when I say chosen to be saved, that's the that's clearly taught in the scripture. Thessalonians 2.13, brothers and sisters, we're always bound to thank God for you, love to the Lord. From the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the spirit, through belief in the truth. So there's... Um, God choosing people to be saved from the very beginning that he loves and does a sanctifying work of the Spirit so they believe in the truth, so they understand and know and believe that he is he. And I'd like him to respond to that, you know, from the scripture, not um, just, you know, his own ideas and opinions, but actually show me where that's actually not the case, that God doesn't choose people for salvation individually and effectually through a personal calling to be in Christ Jesus, to know and understand and believe that he is he. Uh, I hope you heard me say that I got to hop off right now because I'll be back an hour and a half. I said that like five minutes ago, but it just reconfirmed. Yeah, I never heard that. Well, maybe we could pick it up some other time with Daniel. Hey, that sucks. That, that was very good, TS. Um, Maybe someone else in the room who wants to combat what T.S. is saying can go up against him. Well, I mean, nobody disagrees, or at least I as an Orthodox Christian don't disagree that God chooses people. N nobody disagrees with the concept of election. So, you know, he was trying to respond to Daniel's insinuation that certain aspects of TULIP 
as typically described by Calvinists are slippery. Well, I tend to agree with Daniel. I don't think that they all do it. But Daniel's complaint wasn't so much about the specifics of any one aspect of the doctrine, any one letter of the acronym. His complaint was more about the ambiguity of the language typically used to deliver these things. So I don't think you really engaged with Daniel's criticism. Our main problem is, does man actually cooperate in this plan of salvation? Now, we agree that everyone's going to agree, but no one is Pelagian. Like, we all agree that we need grace. We cannot come to God on our own. So that's not going to be contention from any side. But the question is, when God draws us, do we respond or does he like irresistibly elect well, us and our will doesn't well, there are people in here that are playing that's where it becomes as, an issue if you, if you according to the gospel if you deny this the, the son yeah, of there's god there's people in there that are playing you know there's some that hold the free uh, free will yeah, that you can lose your salvation answer, but that didn't as, answer my question at all no, 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 it, no. Did, it did. It, it did. It, it did. The, no, the no, only no, thing no. that damns the only thing that damns an individual would be the denial of the son of god brother so right. like let's like, like, let's stop let's stop acting like Calvin denied sir, the Son of God. Sir, sir, the reason why that didn't answer my question is because I agree people uh, resist the yeah, Son of God. and Calvin agrees with that too. So then no, you don't believe grace can be resisted. So have you not... have you have you read his commentary if, uh, on John three sixteen through twenty eight? Yeah. I think you got to be using uh, hyper Calvinist again. What's yeah, your Jesus, grace, sir. Tell us what that means. I'm sorry. Have you read his commentary on on John three sixteen through twenty uh, to three five? Hey, excuse me. I'm asking you a question. What is irresistible grace? What does that mean? Tell me. Please let TS respond. Yeah, to the irresistible grace, or yeah, I could respond to that. Jesus taught it, and I think he was referencing in John chapter three, where Jesus said, "That which is of the flesh is of the flesh; that which is of the spirit is of the spirit." That's why I said you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it's coming or where it's going. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus says, how can these things be? And then Jesus says, you're a teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things. We testify about, about what we see and what we know, but you people do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you believe me not, how will you believe me if I tell you heavenly things? And Jesus gives us the answer. He's, he's not clueless to how a person believes heavenly things. He says, if you don't believe when I tell you earthly things, how will you believe when I tell you heavenly things? Well, he gives us the answer, a man must be born again. It's a necessity. He doesn't say a man must believe to be born again. He said a man must be born again. It's a necessity that they're born of the Spirit so they can receive the things of the Spirit. Notice how he says to Nicodemus, you're a teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things. And that's what I said about the natural disposition of men. There's none righteous, no, not even one. There's none who understand. There's none who seek after God. We see um, that about the natural man in Second Corinthians, that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned. In other words, you need to have the Holy Spirit. You need to be born again to be able to discern the things of the Spirit. Otherwise, the natural man, the man without the Spirit, it's foolishness unto them. That would be Nicodemus, who's not understanding these things, he's not born again. And Jesus is talking about the necessity of being born again of the Spirit. He says the wind blows where it wishes. In other words, the wind goes where it wants and no one can stop it. Um, it's an irresistible force. It, it cannot be stopped. It cannot be resisted. It cannot be avoided. That's the way the wind is. And he says, and he compares it to the Spirit. And he says, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it's coming and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Using this language that you're born of the Spirit, much like the wind blowing upon a person. And, and it has a reaction and a person comes alive. Uh, he's saying it's a necessity that you must be born again to be able to believe heavenly things. So that's clearly taught that regeneration precedes faith by Jesus. And then he goes on, you know, in John 3.16, just some verses later that says, the one who believes has everlasting life. Well, how do you believe heavenly things? A man must be born again. Uh, hello? Hi, Fallen. Howdy. <laughs> 
That was interesting language he just used there. So he accused me of misunderstanding what it means, but let's get this straight. He said it cannot be avoided. So in other words, it's going to happen. So when yeah, God gives this man, it, it can't be resisted. It can't be avoided, right? Yeah. People resist God's grace all the time, but when it comes to being born of the Spirit, that's the point. Is Like when you were born of your mother, you didn't have a will or a choice over it. So the language is used, those who are born out of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, nor of human decision, nor of bloodline, but they were born of God. So when people are born, they're born of God, they're born of the Spirit, they're born from above. And that is language used to show you, you know, to, to relate your natural birth. Well, I didn't have a will or a choice over it. I came into this life and it wasn't my decision. It wasn't my choice. It was the will of someone else. But that right there, that's the whole contention. So once you're elected by God and you receive this grace, you can't resist it. Yeah. Why is that the contention that God can save whom he wills and they cannot, uh, ultimately stop God. <laughs> I don't, you know, like, uh, because monergism does, is heresy and it's not the it case. Does. Well, that's just, you're just stating you're not showing me anything from the scripture. Like you're not actually rebutting anything I said or showing me anything from the scripture. You're just stating, hold on, hold on. Let me finish. And, and that's a straw let me, man. If we just not, hold on, hold on. No, 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 hold on. Hold on. I, that's fine. Just, if you want to speak, just do, actually rebu rebuke me and correct me from the scripture. Otherwise, like, you know, Daniel yeah, said, oh, these guys no, are sneaky. Uh -huh. Well, then he sneaks out of here when I bring up verses about, you know, how a person actually knows, understand, believes, chosen for salvation, chosen to be in Christ Jesus by a personal calling. And, man, he's out of here, you know, like, and he calls us being sneaky. And I'm not a Calvinist, by the way. I'm Sovereign Grace. Well, it did seem slightly convenient. And, I, you know, I wonder if Daniel will want to pick up this conversation again. And I wonder if anyone else will, like you guys that are, I, I that are holding the free will. will. Can you rebuke? Uh, all, I, look, look, I just want to be corrected from the scripture if I'm wrong here. You know, like, I don't want to be just told, yeah, you know, yeah, sneaky. Sneak sneak <laughs> and I'm not handling the Bible and right. Like, well, show me from the scripture. We'll be happy to give you an example right now. First Corinthians 3, 9. Do you know the Greek word in that verse? It's synergoi. Bible teaches synergy in the Greek. Monergism yeah, Christians do not no. reject synergy, Monergy. dude. Nowhere. Hold Monster on, hold on. Do. Calm down. Calm you down. I'm a, I'm a Calvinist, right? I'm telling you straight up that we as monergists do not reject that you have to cooperate with God. No, because that's synergism, sir. Do you believe in synergism or monergism? Which one? I, hold on. Did you just hear what I said? What you're Modern, we do not that deny view. that you have to cooperate hey, with God. Guys, the only stop, thing we say is stop, that God. Stop, stop, shut up, Behog. Shut up, Behog. Shut up. All right. So the question to you, Ty, from Truth Speller, was actually not where do you find in the Bible synergism. He asked you where do you see God reaching out into creation for a specific purpose and failing. That's what he asked you. Uh, we can go to John 6. It's actually a perfect example because that's the same verse you guys use. But can we please answer my question before we move on to that? What is James, monergism? James, James 222, to answer your question, James right. 222 is a direct scripture uh, quotation against the idea of monergism. Um, in fact, it teaches synergism. You see that faith was active along with the word right there, synergy, works along with, synergizes with his works. And by works, faith was brought to a completion. So there you have so the entire. I'll just thing. ask the question again. We're, we're talking the, the about question from Truth it Spell was not. Oh, sorry. You... sorry about that. Yeah, the, the, the original question was. Go to a Bible verse where God reaches out and selects someone, but fails. It wasn't about synergism or monergism. Well, Judas is a perfect example of this. He was once saved, so. Actually, he was. Perfect. Thank Jesus, you, sir. Jesus said he knew from the beginning those who believe not and the one who would betray him, speaking of Judas Iscariot. And then he goes on to say, and this is why I That's told correct. you that no man can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. Because coming and believing is equated in the same thing in that chapter. 
like where he says he who comes to me will never. No, come it makes a distinction. Hold on, I'm not. It, it, it makes I'm a not, distinction. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not that's hold incorrect. On. Not, look, if you want to, that's fine. But just you gotta let me finish my sentence. Um. So Jesus equates coming and believing with the same thing. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. That it gets the same result, that you're satisfied. That if you come, you, you'll never uh, hunger. If you believe, you'll never thirst. So when he says, this I told you that no man can come to me unless it is granted him my father. He's literally saying no man can believe in me because coming and believing equated the same thing. Same chapter. He says no man can come to me unless it is granted him by my father. You know, so... Um, he says it twice in two different ways, you know, all, no one can come to me unless the Father sent me, draws him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. Speaking of the universal inability, no man can come. That's why it says none seek after God. No one can come unless it is granted by the Father that someone come, and that person that comes uh, is drawn by the Father is raised up at the last day. All right, that didn't answer any of our questions. Do you think we believe man can come to God on his own? Well, in fa all fairness, I, uh, you never did answer my question about God failing to choose people. I mean, you tried with saying Judas. I but gave you an it example. Was, it was chosen that, Judas. That, that he was chosen that scripture may be fulfilled. Like when it when the scripture identifies why a person is chosen, then you have to accept that reason. Well, it's scripture says that he was chosen that uh, scripture might be fulfilled. And the betrayal of Jesus. Now we have other people where it clearly says that they're chosen for salvation, chosen to know and understand and believe that he is he, chosen to be in Christ Jesus through a personal, individual, effectual calling. The same verse we just read made a distinction. It said Jesus from the very beginning in John 6, 64 to 66, it makes a distinction. Jesus knew from the very beginning those who did not believe him and the one who would betray him. Now, according to you guys, if Judas was never saved, Judas should have been included in the ones who, quote unquote, never believe. But that's just not what the text says. It's you making this, he this, betrayed this him. distinction. It's, he he's betrayed saying him. out of the no, group no, no. of the Hold unbelievers. On, I'm, not it's saying, I'm not done. I'm not done, please. Okay. The point is that the text makes this distinction for this very reason. We know that Judas was saved. And he betrayed Christ. You don't betray someone that you never believed in to begin with. The text makes that distinction. So that's going to be the problem here. We gave you an example. Okay. Well, Ty, Ty, slow yeah. down. Yeah. Take us to it. Take us to the text where it says Judas was saved. <laughs> yeah. Right. And not only that, but it's actually his betrayal is a sign that he didn't believe. If he really believed that Jesus was the Son of God that would judge the world in righteousness, that all judgment was committed to him that uh, you, you think that he would actually betray the Son of God for 30 pieces of silver. So I'm going to stop right here because these false teachers always try to say that Judas believed and he lost his salvation. And they try to use this argument to prove free will and also loss of salvation. But we see in John 13, Jesus say, I'm not speaking about all of you. I know the ones whom I have chosen. This is happening so that scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I'm telling you before it happens so that when it does happen, you may believe that I am he. So Jesus is talking about an event that will take place in the future, his betrayal, so that when it does happen, those that he has chosen will believe that he is he. Remember, you are my witnesses, declare the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and understand and believe that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall be they after me. I alone am the Savior. So Jesus says, I'm not speaking about all of you. I know the ones whom I have chosen. So what he's saying is, I haven't chosen Judas to believe. I am not speaking about all of you. I know the ones whom I have chosen, but this is happening so that scriptures may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I'm telling you before it happens so that when it does happen, you may believe that I am he. Now he's speaking to the ones that he's chosen to believe. Now Judas was chosen to be a vessel of wrath and to betray Jesus according to scripture so that scripture could be fulfilled. We see that Pharaoh was chosen to be a vessel of wrath and destruction. For this very purpose I have raised you up, that my power may be demonstrated in all the earth. 
So when it comes to those who are going to believe, Jesus knows who those are because he's chosen them to believe. You are my witnesses, declare the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and understand and believe that I am he. So when he's speaking about Judas, he's saying, I'm not speaking about all of you. In other words, I'm not speaking about Judas. I know the ones whom I have chosen, but this is happening so that scripture may be fulfilled. So a lot of these people that I argue with online don't care to get deeply into the scripture and parse these things out because they simply don't want them to be true. They want their free will perspective to be true, the idea that you can lose your salvation and things like this. So I'm going to go ahead and get back into this. What well, one quick uh, criticism here is that you can't. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't freak I, out, Behog. It, it's a quick. Oh, let him answer. I, wow. Ty, take us, take us to, take us, Ty, take us to the scripture that said Judas was saved. Uh, let me see if I can find this first. It said something about uh, the disciples' names being written up. Uh, give me just a second. Yo, 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 yo. Hey, what's up, Monkey? You ready to shred uh, Calvinism today? Yeah, but I'm not monkey anymore. But yeah, I'll shred Calvinism. Why not? Okay. All right. So what are we debating? Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide. What's going on? Sola Stupidity. Just calm down. Just calm down, Ty. Luke or 10. Wait, hold up. Luke 10. Okay. Yeah, let me go to Luke 10. What? Pulled this up. Is he still searching for the disciples that shows us that Judas was saved? No, Ty, I don't. I don't agree. No, I'm talking that's about why I'm ones. making you take us there. The one, the ones in Luke 10. No, Ty, I don't agree. Take us to the text where it says Judas is saved. Well, no, I want I wanted to bring up this point specifically because um, we know. We know out of all the 72, most of the disciples left. That's why we have John 6, 66 in the first place. Hi. It gets to the text where it talks about Judas's salvation. I'm going to the text. Chill out. I'm giving you examples, please. The reason why we're going to this text is because, you know, Christ made a promise that their names were written in heaven, right? Does it show that Judas is saved? What does it mean for your name to be written in heaven? What does that mean? Does it show that Judas is saved, sir? If his name was written in heaven, or these disciples' names are written in heaven, what does that mean? Yes, so, of okay, course they so, were. So, if you don't want to answer the question, if you don't I'm want to answer your question, so we can actually see where I, you're getting it. Yo, Ty, yo, Ty, Let, let's leave. We're all leaving. The apostolics are leaving. Let's go. Okay. Literally, he's saved if his name is written in heaven. Okay. That's why I brought it up. Show us where Judas's name is written in heaven. Well, I gave you an example with the other disciples as well. You said any example. So so this also fits into the criteria. I just want Judas, sir. Hold on. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to go the, to the other chat. Well, he ran, and he never provided the text, so yeah, he can't get yeah, that's there. true. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah, well, those, you guys these guys wanted to flex on the sovereignty of God and His grace, but then when it actually, you know, when they actually get tested with this stuff, they're they're just fleeing. I, I get, you know, and we're this, and we're the sneaky ones. It, it, it's incredible. He, he tried to be sly and say that we all agree that Judas was saved. And I'm like, whoa, hold, pump the brakes. Where'd you see that? Take us there. And then he takes us to texts that, that do not show that at all. It's just a, it's a mystifying thing. I don't understand. This is why you always have to slow them down and not agree to just move forward with them. You just have to say, whoa, I, I don't actually agree with what you just said there. Show me that. Yeah, right, because it can get passed over and it's a pertinent point. Um, yeah, I, I, that text is saying that, you know, he knew from the beginning those who believe not and the one who would betray him. That 
it's indicating that out of these group of believers, unbelievers, there would be one that would betray him. And uh, that's a sign of someone being an unbeliever in what Christ is saying, because what Christ is disclosing to these people is that he's the son of God, that he'll judge the world in righteousness. Um, all these things that if, if you really, truly believe them, the idea that you would just give him over for 30 pieces of silver is just insane. Yeah, that's just cowardice on their part. They want to flee. I don't mind. Let them do it. It's like saying, imagine someone coming up to you and going, then they say, for 30 pieces of silver, I'll give you 30 pieces of silver if you go to hell. <laughs> you know, like who's going to say, yeah, for the judgment that it's going to be, you know, like who's going to say, yeah, you know, if they really believe it, unless, you know, just have no brain cells. Okay. Well, I didn't hope uh, that didn't kill the room. I was hoping to get some answers from them. They seem Can I ask you confident. something? Yeah. Sorry for jumping in. No, you didn't. You didn't kill the room. They have this uh, back channel thing that they'll do as soon as the argument is not going their way and they want to divert somewhere else. If we keep it on track, they'll just flee because they see they see the problem with Ty's argument. I I saw it right away, so they don't want to defend that. Yeah. Can I ask you guys something? Sure. Do you have to be Christian to be in this chat? No, I don't. Yes. So. Oh. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, no. I'm okay. Kidding. Yeah. I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. Here I meet up with some Eastern Orthodox in a Discord server, and they hold to transubstantiation, where they actually believe when they take the Eucharist that it turns into the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. So they literally believe that they're being saved through a ritual of cannibalism. And one of the, the fellows goes on to say that to me at one point, because I say, Will you believe I won't be saved unless I do your Eucharist at your church? And it's literally the body and blood of Jesus Christ that I'm eating and drinking. And he said, he didn't say that. He says, Jesus said that. But it's just the misapplication and misinterpretation of what Jesus actually taught. So when you get into the teachings of the Eastern Orthodox, what you find is they believe in ritual cannibalism. That when they take part of the Eucharist, that it's literally changing into the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. They do not believe it is a shadow archetype or a symbolic reference of what Jesus has accomplished through his flesh and through his blood, but they actually believe that when they partake of it, it literally turns into flesh and blood. And they don't believe that you can be saved unless you do this. Under their organization and your eating of that bread, and wine and it's supposed to be literal flesh and blood so what I was trying to point out to these fellows is they don't believe that you're saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ they ultimately believe that they're saved through a ritual of cannibalism you can literally believe in Jesus Christ all you want in his atonement on your behalf but unless you actually partake of this ritual the sacerdotalism by which you believe this is literally the body and blood of Jesus Christ which is cannibalism that's actual flesh and blood then they say you can't be saved so i'm gonna go ahead and get right to the video uh in uh for example in john 6 it says those who eat of my flesh drink of my blood you will inherit the eternal life uh like uh, play, like it isn't just yeah oh, all those verses you interpret them to be of yourself and of your, then it becomes of works because it becomes of yourself and of your works is the way you interpret it like Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. So I recognize that when I have came to Jesus and I believed in him, that I have eaten and drinking of his flesh, of his flesh, that he's the bread of life. You translate it into a physical action. You have to do it of yourself. It becomes a work by which you believe if you don't do it, you won't be saved. See, I believe you're saved by faith. I still maintain that because that's what Jesus is saying. When I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. If it's symbolical as you presented, why does why why does, doesn't he say, "Oh, I'm talking symbolically"? Why does he allow people to? Live well, he's spoken parables all the time. He said, "You know, the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, but in others that it comes in parables." So, seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, or at least they turn and understand and be forgiven. 
which is salvation, to turn and understand and be forgiven. And he's saying he says these things and, and para, parables, they're parabolic. They're, they're physical oh, things meant damn. to impart a spiritual meaning. And then people think it is a physical thing that it wasn't meant for and they interpret it incorrectly. And so, yeah, he didn't always speak. Plain. Notice how he never spoke plainly out in public. He always spoke in parables. And then when he got in private, he would tell the people that were close to him that he chose the private interpretations. Well, if that's the case, then you don't really know what he told them. Oh, no, it's in the scripture. Oh, yeah, the no, we, we can, no, we can know what he told them by the Holy Spirit. No. What no, do you no. mean, no? I mean what I said. I said no. I said, because here's the problem. You got, you know, for every different thing that somebody wants to say that they know because the Holy Spirit, some individual I'm saying, not like the church as a body, but for every individual with their interpretation supposedly from the Holy Spirit, very often these interpretations contradict. One person says, well, the Holy Spirit confirmed to me that John 3, 5 is not talking about water baptism. Next person says, well, the Holy Spirit confirmed to me John 3, 5 is talking about water baptism. Yeah, being that there's contradictions in people doesn't mean that there isn't someone teaching. And there's, you know, like a, my perspective as a sovereign, someone holds a sovereign grace. Those that are of the Spirit will hear the sound of it. They'll hear the voice of God. The sheep will understand what the Scripture is teaching in terms of how someone's saved through Christ. They won't go the way of Cain and look to their works and their performance and deny the propitiation for other people. As far as believers. Yeah, that doesn't really like address the issue. Though. Well, it, yeah, it does because you're I just saying that there's really alternative interpretation. So... Well, John says, you have an anointing, you have no need that any man teach you, but the Spirit himself will teach you and guide you and lead you into all truth. So, like, I, you're saying, I need someone else to teach you, teach me, right? I interpret that very clearly and precisely that John is saying that he's given me the Spirit, that I don't need any, I, hold on, I don't need any, I don't, like, need your, your church father. I, like, I got, I got the Spirit. I mean, well, that, that's just... Oh, <laughs> So when I tell him that I have the Holy Spirit as my teacher leading me and guide me into all truth, he says that I just have pride misleading me. And I actually gave him a scripture to prove my point. That you have no need that any man teach you, but the Spirit himself will teach you and lead you and guide you into all truth. And he's saying I'm being prideful if I don't just submit my own reason and logic to his church fathers. And he's saying I'm prideful if I believe that the Holy Spirit is leading me and guide me in all truth and give me an understanding in relation to his word as I study. And it's funny that he's accusing me of pride when his whole religious system is based on works, that you have to do these works and different things in order to be saved. When I don't believe that you're saved by anything that you do at all, you're saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself, but as a gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. But no, oh, how is it pride? Like, I'm not relying on myself or human flesh. I'm not relying so, on yeah, I, I get elsewhere, it. Elsewhere, elsewhere, in Luke, in Luke 22, 17 to 20, let's make this out. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, Eucharisto, basically Eucharist, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the wine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, Eucharisto, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, also, he took the cup and supper, after supper, said, This is cup for the new covenant in my blood, which I shed for you. Is this symbolical representation of his body and blood, or is it his actual body and blood? You're talking about the Last Supper, right? Yeah, this is. Yes. Yeah, he's he has wet. <laughs> he has bread and wine that are symbolic archetypes of what he's about to do. That he's about mm -hmm. to shed his blood um, and die for those that believe as a propitiation. So yeah, it's a, so yeah, Christ it's not a literal. Became a yeah. human, they weren't doing cannibalism there. Bro, where do you get that from? Nobody said Christ symbolically became a human. That's a straw man. I mean, misrepresentation. If, if he says... So no, when is, is, when is actual bread and wine that Listen, Jesus is breaking says, there at the table, actual flesh and blood? It's blood, body, uh, bloodless sacrifice that he is providing. 
which is bread and wine, his actual, in this instance, body and blood. They're, they're, they are, it's, yeah, yeah it's, Jesus it's actual yeah. bread and it's an actual wine that is a symbolic uh, reference and, to his and blood then and his it blood. Says, yeah, we don't teach otherwise, that we don't teach that he didn't, that there wasn't a single sacrifice. It's implicit in our Eucharistic theology that the Eucharist that is partaken of in every Orthodox parish around the world every day is the one and the same Eucharist of back then. Yeah, and the and they, timeless and singular offering. So, and the word sacrifice in Luke uh, 22 okay. 19. I didn't know that word, about the uh, Orthodox Church. Is yeah. the word anamnesi. Have you ever which done means, DNA uh, testing on Remembrance thing? sacrifice. So, we do this in remembrance of the sacrifice that happened at 33 AD yeah. by Christ Jesus. And through this remembrance of the sacrifice, uh, we inherit yeah. eternal life. And our sins are forgiven, and right through what you do, stuff. the work of yourself. That and but does this have you ever has, so you no, believe it turns into God the literal body and blood of Jesus? Into into the, uh, yeah, do you ever do any DNA testing on that or anything? Does it taste like blood or does it taste like are flesh? You or right now, or are you? I'm just curious because I've never done the Eucharist, so I'm I've never been involved, so I'm guessing if it's really Jesus's flesh and blood, it should have a taste like blood, it should. Kind of look like you know, it shouldn't taste like wine and bread. I mean, if it's literal, if it's not symbolic and it's literal, right? You're it literally, tasting, should be tasting. You you're tasting bread and wine. You e are eating bread and wine, but that bread and wine are Christ's so, blood so it's symbolic and body. It's actually no, it's, it's actually actual, that bread. Actual, now, if I did DNA body. testing, is it going to come up like I'm going to find a person? From two thousand years ago, connected to that, or is it going to be? Is it going to be? No, I'm not an atheist. I just, yeah, yeah, of course, I, I, <laughs> of course, I want to be logical place. with what Jesus is saying and what what you're doing. Like you're telling me it's literally flesh and blood, but it, it, it tastes nothing like flesh and blood. It tastes like bread and wine. Problems. Well, that 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 makes me to believe that it's actually bread <laughs> and wine, and Jesus <laughs> meant it was a shadowed archetype of something Substance. that was representative of what he was going to do. We're trying to tell you the position so you don't so you don't misunderstand. So the position is that when it's consecrated, it, the, the substance does truly change after the drop. body and blood of Christ. However, you hear what they're saying? Uh, what we're going to say is that the accidental properties remain. So it's still going to look like bread and still going to taste like bread, but it's not actually bread. Like it, we'd say once it's consecrated, it, it literally is the flesh of Christ. But if you were to put so it under the main a problem. If you if you were to put it under a microscope and examine it or you cut it open, it's still gonna look like bread, but it's not bread basically, pretty much. So I think most people who have problems with transub, uh, like Protestants, and I'm talking about like actual Protestants, they usually say it's more so a metaphysical issue, but they don't have a problem with real presence. Like this is just like this low church nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> So you're saying that it has two state at the same time, uh, it's bread and flesh at the same time. Yes. So you see here, one person asks, is it both states at the same time? In other words, is it bread and wine and the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ at the same time? And the one guy that's been arguing with me about this on the Eastern Orthodox side says, yes, yes, it's, it's both states at the same time. And then the other fellow who's an Eastern Orthodox says no, and he be, you can tell he's aggravated. They don't know what they actually truly believe. They can't really ground this nonsense. Because the other guy doesn't believe that it's two states at the same time. He believes that it's actually the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ when you're eating it. He's not saying that it's two states at the same time, or it's a symbolic reference or a shadow and archetype. He's saying that it's actually the body and blood of the Lord Jesus. And you can see that they can't get their doctrine straight between one another. One believes that it can be both states at the same time. The other one gets aggravated when he thinks about that concept and says, no, that's not what's happening. So between each other, they don't even have the doctrine right. Hey, TS, um, you there? Did you understand what he just said? Yeah, and, it, and, and I don't mean to be insulting, but I'm sure you guys heard that phrase, uh, peeing on my leg and telling me it's raining. Because it's like what people mean by that is 
I can see the obvious here, but you guys are telling me something that is complete contradictory. You're telling me this is blood. You're telling me this is flesh. As I look and examine, and even if I put it under a microscope and do a DNA examination, it's going to come up red. It's not going to be. It's not going to be actual flesh and blood. So it Jesus is, had to mean a shadow. And as he's having, as he's having dinner right, with him, as he's had several times before, he's now saying this is going to be a representative of of something I am going to do. I'm going to shed my blood. I'm going to give my flesh for the life of the world. Okay. Yeah. Hey, can you, can you tell me? You know that there's another example of something that, if you study it under a microscope, it looks like. Take Jesus. When you study him, he looks like a man, which he is a man. And he's also God, right? So when you studied it under a microscope, could you discern that he was God? Well, I don't think you can put God under a microscope in the sense that, you know, you're talking about the incarnation of Christ who really did, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He really did become flesh. And flesh really does have yeah, genetic yeah. and we, we, biological we makeup. Hold on, hold on. Flesh really does have biological and genetic makeup. And so when you tell me that you're eating his flesh and blood, if I examine that material, it should have the same type of genetic and biological makeup as flesh does. Okay. I mean, but and my Black analogy, right? explains that, man. The people looked at Jesus, some of them, that didn't have faith and they said look this is just a man um but you know he's god right you have faith you know he's both god and man right but man mm -hmm. again is not made up of yeast and sugars in the way that bread is there might there might be some of that going on but Hold on, Neither hold on. When you say man, again, that has to do with a particular biological, scientific makeup that can be examined, demonstrated, and proved, and repeated. The, yeah. the point is, though, it's not a metaphysical contradiction. Like, he, he said the example with the, the incarnated Christ. If, if someone examined his biology under a microscope, obviously, they're not going to be able to discern that, hey, this is truly God who incarnated here, right? We say, we profess he's truly human. If they were to test his biology under a microscope or whatever the case, um, it's gonna look like he's just human, right? At a surface level. We know he's more than just human, but that's what the, that's what the, um, the scientific research would indicate. That's like all he's trying to point out. Like it, it wouldn't metaphysically be a contradiction. Well, there's like, yeah, there is, there is a contradiction in the fact that you're telling me it's actual blood and body of Jesus, right? But one, upon examination, you know, the taste the taste test and the examination test of looking at it and eating it, I see that it's bread. I see that it's actually wine. So I think about Jesus and he says this, you know, do this in remembrance of me, not in remembrance of your sins, which I think a lot that's what a lot of people are doing in remembrance of their sins remembrance of me and what Jesus did in reference to removing them as far as the east is to the west uh you know that that's the the mm. you know so yeah hold on I, I'm I almost, I'm almost finished you, warfare I was almost what, what Ty was so saying. that's what to do you know in remembrance of him and it's a symbolic archetype of something that's already happened not you know when he said it's finished it was finished and there doesn't have to be a repeat of it or he doesn't have to show up with actual body and blood to make something happen like a actual kind of ritual thing you have to do to make because that's what it's turned into of yourself and of your works and and i would say you right you guys would say it, if i don't participate in that I, if i don't do it then i um then i won't be saved you know i don't take part in christ but jesus is telling me well, well we yeah but that. that's well christ that's your that. fault but here's the question for you died. Here's here's the here, here's the question for you though. And I'm really just going to follow along with what Ty had brought up. If you had, if Christ was physically present before you, like right now, imagine imagine that science was around and DNA testing and all that stuff two thousand years ago. Okay, and people were trying to convince you that Christ was God and man. And somebody like you comes along and they're like, "Well, let's test the let's test," and then 
so the DNA is going to come back human and only human, correct? Yeah, you're making a you're I see where you're going, but you're making a Would false you agree with that so we can move on. Comes, hold, yeah, yeah. Hold, hold, I'll, hold, I'll, hold, yeah, go ahead. Hold, I'll, hold, I'll point hold, out hold, the false equivocation. Hold, 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 but go ahead. So, yeah. just, you, you can either. Uh, I'm not. Yeah, listen, slow down. Go ahead. Slow down, dude. So I'm just asking you. I'm just asking you if you agree that the right, DNA because God is spirit and He's not human. flesh. Just a simple yes so or no. He's, for a, now. he's encapsulated in flesh. So yeah, you're not right. That's why I mean the false okay. equivocation. Okay. Like, dude, hello. right? But bread, you can test. Okay. Bread, you can test. So I'll stop it right there because they're getting ready to mute me where I'm not able to speak at all, which is typically what they do. But I'm pointing out that he's making a false equivocation between a spirit that cannot be tested by physical, material, mechanical means. When it comes to wine or bread or any other created thing on the planet, you can test it in the way that he's saying. But when it comes to God, you cannot put him under a microscope. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So he's saying that if you did a DNA test of Jesus 2,000 years ago, wouldn't it only come up a man? And yes, I agree, because you cannot test the spirit under a microscope. And so if you did do a DNA test on Jesus' body and flesh, it would come up as the flesh of a man. It wouldn't test as bread and wine. So they're distorting metaphysical categories and they're not understanding that you can't even test a spirit by scientific means. You cannot put a spirit under a microscope or under DNA analysis and determine its DNA. It's ridiculous. But see, these people, these Eastern Orthodox, they take Jesus' words when he said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no life in you to mean something literal. That Jesus says, that unless you literally eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, which is cannibalism, you'll have no life in you. Jesus was always speaking in metaphor where he would point to physical things and they would be shadows and archetypes of spiritual things. And Jesus rectifies this for us when he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. That the one who has come to Jesus and believed in him has eaten of the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. It's a metaphorical reference of eating and drinking of the bread of life, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. That if you come and you believe, you have eaten and you have drinking. But these people make it a literal thing, and they say that you have to literally eat the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And they'll tell someone like me who has faith alone in Jesus Christ that I'm not saved, that I have to do this ritual, that I have to participate in sacerdotalism, that I have to do this uh, thing, which they have made it into a work, which is to do in remembrance of Christ and his accomplishments and who we are on the basis of that. And now they have made it a literal work that you have to do in order to save yourself. You can believe in Jesus and his atonement all you want by faith alone, but that won't save you. You have to participate in this ritual. And if you don't participate in this ritual, which they believe is ultimately cannibalism of Jesus Christ, where you are literally drinking his blood and eating his flesh, unless you're literally doing that, you won't be saved and you won't have eternal life. And it's all built on a misapplication and a faulty interpretation of Jesus when he says, Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no life in you. And he's speaking again about those who come and believe in him. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. But people that go the way of Cain will always turn what Jesus says on its head and turn it out to be a work rather than faith alone in Jesus Christ himself. So I'm going to go ahead and play the rest of this video. They ended up muting me and I just leave because... You know, what they want me to do is sit there with a muzzle in my mouth or I can't speak or I have to sit there and listen to their monologuing, their false doctrine. So it's it's typical when you just point out their absurdity and how illogical and how unbiblical they are. They just end up muting you and, you know, throwing you out of the server oftentimes as well. So go ahead and get back into this. Slow down, dude. <laughs> unbelievable. Look. No, what's unbelievable is the, your inability to be patient and follow the line of reasoning where I'm it's going. I'm trying to be patient, so, but he, he you're making a false communication against the spirit and against physical. Do you agree?
something that actually can be tested. God Fair cannot enough. be tested. Yes, man. Spirit. He's trying to be like, like you. Why was he able to give you the same patience you're not able to give him? Uh, it's it's done. He could save it. I don't you understand. Gotta, pick, pick, pick a new topic. <laughs> uh, wait, I have a question. Can we continue with him? Maybe he's hurt. I have one, I have one no, question. No, we can't. You take him to another room. I'm not listening. Yeah. Take him to another room. It's that easy. Oh, okay. I didn't know you were. Mom. Yeah. No, he's cut. I yeah, mean, it's crazy. Right. So at the end there, one of the fellows says crazy, like perhaps I was acting crazy as I was speaking up against their cannibalism, their teaching that they have eternal life, not through faith alone in Jesus Christ. As Jesus taught, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. They are actually teaching that you're saved through cannibalism, that in order to be saved, you have to literally eat of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and literally drink of his blood. Jesus says, my words are spirit and they are life. So his words are spirit, but they're taking them as literal words when he says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you will have no life in you. It's a metaphorical reference to coming and believing in Jesus Christ. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And because these people haven't actually come to Christ and believed in him, they are turning his words into a work and they believe that you're saved by your works and you have to actually do a work of cannibalism and literally eat of the body of Jesus Christ and drink of his blood in order to be saved. That's how you're saved by this ritual of cannibalism, of eating of Jesus' flesh and drinking of his blood. That's how you're ultimately saved in the Eastern Orthodox Eucharist. So you can see how completely unreasonable they are. So I hope all is well with you guys. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Take care. Hope your night or day is going good. God bless. Gonna be here soon.